All right, hello everyone. I'm Chris Campbell with the Food Institute. And on behalf of DMA, I'd like to welcome you all to our webinar, Bring Back Traffic with Plant-Based. We here at the Food Institute have been tracking the food industry for over 90 years. And in the last year, we've accelerated our programming of podcasts, webinars, and other digital content. We'd invite you to visit foodinstitute.com to learn more about membership, sponsorship, and advertising opportunities. I'd first like to introduce Marie Moldy, account manager and registered dietitian at Data Central with a strong background in food, nutrition, and business, holding a combined MBA RD from Dominican University, Marie brings that essential a unique culinary perspective and health-driven point of view. Restaurant chains and suppliers have rely, uh, relied on Marie's expertise in menu and product development, and for years she's helped food service and retail companies excel in innovation. I'd also like to introduce chef, TV host, and author Priyanka Naik. Priyanka is a self-taught Indian vegan chef, Food Network champion, Quibi Dishmantled winner, TV host, and author. She is a food and TV personality who hosts Dish It Healthy with Priyanka Nike, a taste made original clean eating food show on Food Network Kitchen, and is the author of The Modern Tiffin out on November 2nd and available for pre order now. And last but not least, we welcome Matthew Jordan, corporate executive chef of national accounts for Nestle Professional. Matthew works with the top national restaurant brands in North America to build their menus. He is a seven time Food Network competition show veteran and television professional and won. Comeback Kitchen Season 2 and Cutthroat Kitchen on the Food Network. And just as a reminder, a recording of this webinar will be made available after a short processing period, and the slides will be included in that email. So with that all said, I'll hand it off to Marie to get us started. Excellent. Well, thank you so much, Chris, and thank you to all of you on the webinar with us today. I'm so thrilled to be here to share uh, an update on what's the state of the industry with plant-based eating, uh, what the core opportunities are, what the new research is telling us, and, and then turn it over to the chefs to share some amazing plant-based culinary innovations. So I would like to begin by sharing what is the state of how Americans are eating in our country today, and really what their relationship is with meat and with plants. So in this chart here, in the pink trend line is how Americans identify as eating in our country today. Uh, so you can see over on the left here that the majority of us identify as being meat eaters. So unabashed meat eaters eat all different types of animal proteins. That is the majority of people in the United States. Uh, you can then look further down the curve and see diet types like vegetarian, vegan, pescatarian, and they're a lot smaller uh, in population. You know, 3%, 5% of people identify as eating that way. Uh, but what tends to be a much larger group is the notion or the, the diet style of flexitarian eating, which if you're not familiar with that term, that means that a consumer uh, does not eliminate meat products or animal products from their diet. They just focus on plant products and getting more plant-based items and plant-based dishes in their diets. Uh, so today, 14% of Americans identify as being flexitarian eaters. Now, what's also important to think about is how do people want to eat tomorrow? You know, what are we aspiring to do? And you'll notice again, far to the left of this chart that we really see a drop in people who are meat eaters. People tell us they want to move away from that style of eating. Uh, you can see in vegetarian and vegan and pescatarian, there's a small bump in all of those eating types. Uh, but the biggest gain here and the most important one is that increase in flexitarian eaters. So again, those people who don't plan to give up meat products or animal products entirely, but really wanna focus on eating more plant-based foods. So there's a really great built-in audience for people who want to be eating in this flexitarian style today. And consumption desires among people reflect this as well. So if we ask among all the categories of foods that we can eat, what of those are you working to increase in your diet and which of those are you looking to decrease? We can see that plant-based foods are by far the number one category that consumers today want to increase. 58% uh, of Americans are looking to increase plant-based foods. Only 4% of people, so 
one in 25 of us are looking to decrease plant-based foods. You can compare that to at the bottom of the chart there, something like red meat or poultry, where you can see the percentages are quite a bit different. 31% of Americans are looking to decrease red meat. Uh, so within this category of plant-based, plant-based meat substitutes, 33% of us are looking to increase, but really that biggest you know, uh, group here is those 58% of eaters who wanna increase plant-based foods. 58% of people is about 200 million Americans. So there's tons of pent up desire for plant-based consumption. And consumers also get that there's a benefit to plant-based eating. So we hear a lot of different things, you know, it's better for our health and it's better for our planet and it's good for animal welfare. Uh, in this particular case, we've posed the question, if society reduced consumption of meat and increased consumption of plant-based foods, what would happen? 70% uh, of consumers agree that we would be healthier as a population if we did that. And 62% of us agree that this would be better for our planet and better for the environment. So there's really an understanding that plant-based eating comes with a host of benefits that we can realize and capture when we start to eat this way. And really thinking about that benefit of better for the environment, uh, it's given rise to climate-based eating as well. So maybe you've heard the term climatarian. That's a person who focuses their uh, dietary choices on what's good for our planet and what leaves a small carbon footprint. Uh, so the fast casual segment of food service, which tends to be that segment that really drives trends forward or is the first to latch on to a lot of cool new trends, they've started offering items like this, you know, calculators on their website that will help you calculate the carbon footprint of your dish at, you know, Panera or Just Salad or Chipotle has done these things. And what you tend to find is that the more plant-based ingredients that are in your dish, the better your, you know, calculator shows that you're doing for our planet and for our environment. So we certainly think we will continue to see more of this sort of thing. And then at Data Central, we track what's happening at all restaurants across the board. So uh, we have a database that captures uh, menu mentions of 5,000 restaurants across the country. So we use that to understand where trends are beginning in restaurants and kind of forecasting out where trends are predicted to, to go and to grow. And I wanted to share this data here. This is for that keyword plant-based on the menu at restaurants. So it's really shocking. It seems almost unbelievable to think that 10 years ago, 11 years ago in 2010, we literally didn't see this term plant-based on restaurant menus. It just wasn't part of how restaurants were at least writing the description of what was on their menus. But then if you look toward the middle of this chart here, you know, 2015, 2016, 2017, we started to see plant-based appear. And then it's only grown from there. You can see in those green bubbles, that's forecasted growth. So we're expecting to see plant-based continue to really proliferate on restaurant menus. Uh, and this is of course, only those menus that literally have this term plant-based associated with them. So we know that, of course, there's more plant-based items that don't call out this literal term, but seeing huge growth of restaurants menuing plant-based items. And I, I'd be remiss not to mention, you know, what we've been through in the past year and a half in the pandemic and how that has changed people's eating styles and their approach to eating. So we wanted to understand, you know, how has the pandemic impacted consumption of plant-based foods? So were people eating more plant-based foods a year and a half ago? You know, now they're eating less or what does that look like? Uh, our data shows that it really did not have much of an impact. So what we're looking at here is the data in the gray bar is how people approached plant-based eating before the pandemic. And the pink is how they're continuing to eat plant-based now. 
So you can see that it's really neck and neck from how they, you know, approached plant-based foods prior to the pandemic and how they're eating them now. And what it nets out to be is about 38% of our consumers, our population, are eating plant-based foods at least daily or weekly. Now, one thing that the pandemic did change in regard to plant-based eating is, you know, a picture like this might look unfortunately familiar to some of us if we think about what happened to, you know, grocery stores and, and food supplies about a year ago. Uh, there was a lot of media attention, stories from consumers of things like, you know, I went to the grocery store and all the eggs were gone. So, uh, but then I noticed like right above the eggs, there's just plant-based egg, you know, in a bottle. And it's like, oh, cool, I can try that. And that's getting these people who maybe otherwise would not have tried these plant-based substitutes to try them during the pandemic when, you know, options weren't available or maybe when meat was sort of being associated with uh, coronavirus early on, or maybe there was an implication with meat, people kind of steered away from meat for a while and went toward those plant-based meat substitutes. So the pandemic did kind of spark more of these first time uh, trial consumers for plant-based options. And that's really important because we find that when people begin to consume plant-based options that they become loyal to the category. So if you give them a try, you tend to continue to consume them. 87% uh, of people say that they will continue to eat plant-based items into the future if they have started eating that way. So I'd like to take a, a sidebar for a while now here and focus in particular on plant-based meat alternatives. You know, we looked at that trend line for plant-based on restaurant menus and right around 2015 and 2016 was really when these plant-based alternatives that are meant to mimic the texture and the flavor of meat really began to appear. So that was five or six years ago now. And today in 2021, 71% of Americans have tried at least one type of these plant-based meat alternatives. The majority of us have tried at least one of these options that are available in restaurants and at retail uh, today. Here's a couple examples of those. So meat alternatives are popping up in all different formats and flavors and dishes. Uh, these are all recent examples from what's going on at national chains. So Rubio's, which is a Mexican fast casual chain launched this taco salad with impossible meat crumbles. Uh, Carl's Jr. has launched a number of plant-based burgers with the Beyond Burger build. Uh, Ruby Tuesday launched Nestle's Sweet Earth Awesome Burger, and the description here talks about how it's developed for, you know, meat eaters or flexitarians alike, that it really mimics that meat experience. And then KFC has launched a couple times now this Beyond Fried Chicken, so plant-based chicken, which chicken is Americans, you know, number one consumed protein, so maybe that in particular has potential to make a lot of waves into the future as we think about these plant-based alternatives that are popping up to mimic chicken. So burgers tend to be the kind of point of entry for consumers when they think about or begin to try these plant-based meat alternatives. You can see here that a vegetarian or vegan burger, 57% uh, of us have tried this before and 12% of us say we consume that uh, often. Uh, following burgers, it's things like meat substitutes for snacks or sides or appetizers. So that might be something like a meat jerky or you know chicken nuggets or something like that. And then a center plate entree made with a meat substitute. So maybe something like that impossible taco salad. 47% of consumers are uh, eating those types of things with 11% saying they do that pretty often. And we wanted to understand, you know, consumers seem to have this association that 
meat can command a price premium. You know, they get that meat is a premium product and, and they understand that there's a value there. Uh, so we wanted to understand what do they think about plant-based alternatives really when it comes to price? Like, should they be less expensive or might they be more expensive or what's consumers perception of that? And, and what are they willing to pay for these plant-based meat alternatives? And what we find is actually that there really is an appetite among consumers for even higher prices when it comes to plant-based meat alternatives. So uh, especially so for things like plant-based uh, seafood alternatives or center of plate entrees made with plant-based meat substitutes. So like these burgers or the different salad options. Uh, over half of consumers are willing to pay actually more for those plant-based alternative options. And on average, or, or what uh, tends to be, tends to feel most appropriate to consumers is about a dollar or two more in price for the plant-based options. So all of this is leading to stats like this, you know, 47% of consumers say they'd switch to a plant-based burger if a traditional one wasn't available. So that's pretty much one in two people. They're willing to switch if their traditional burger they're looking for isn't there. And this, of course, doesn't also account for the people who actually are looking for these plant-based options. They're going to restaurants today uh, intending to get these uh, plant-based substitutes for you know, maybe when they would have otherwise considered a uh, animal uh, product. So as far as what the future looks like for plant-based eating, we think that we're going to continue to see tons of plant-based innovations. This here is the PLT, the plant lettuce and tomato burger from McDonald's. I believe they tested this in Canada recently and this year, 2021, they're testing in the United States. Uh, we also think we'll see vegetables and fruits and grains and nuts and other whole food plant-based items used in cool uh, and interesting new ways. So things like Chipotle's cauliflower rice, which is advertised here with really a health play, you know, grain-free, a way to lighten your carbs or lower your carbs. You know, it's like what isn't cauliflower used in these days or... Uh, seeing things like mushroom jerkies or all kinds of uh, different plant products used in new and intriguing ways uh, will continue to trend as well. And when we think about food service specifically, where are consumers going to be looking for these plant-based options or where do they want to see them? Lunch is really the predominant day part right now where consumers are interested in seeing plant-based options. So 53% of us are looking for these options at lunch. Uh, that's followed by dinner. You know, 43% of people want meatless or plant-based meals at restaurants for dinner and a little less so at breakfast. So maybe that lunch day part is a, a really key area to think about for initial innovation efforts. And this whole trend, the you know, plant-based and plant-forward uh, eating can really be thought of in those two ways. So plant-based is going to be really meaning vegan. So dishes and ingredients that are entirely made from plants. And there are a lot of consumers, of course, looking for plant-based choices. But it, the trend can also manifest in plant-forward, which means that... Uh, you know, a dish is made mostly of plant products, but it still may have uh, meat or another animal product, cheese on it, maybe just in a smaller quantity or used sort of more as a garnish where in the past or in another type of innovation that would have played more of a center of plate role. Uh, so plant-based, plant-forward, uh, you can think about what makes more sense for your, consu your own consumer base, but uh, both of these offer opportunities to capture those consumers that are looking for incorporating more plant-based items into their diets. And as we blaze this plant forward trail, you know, uh, again, the cool innovations that we're seeing, I'm excited to turn it over to the chefs in a second to share their culinary demos with us. 
You know, I also think it's important, though, to think about the concerns that people have with plant-based or plant-forward eating, because if you know these concerns, we can think about what are the corrective fixes for them that can help uh, kind of solve for these concerns and drive plant forward forward. So right here, we're looking at the top concerns people have with plant forward eating. I'll maybe focus on the top three listed here. So paying too much for plant-based ingredients. We did see that people are willing to pay more for these plant-based alternatives. And it's not uncommon to hear consumers say that they're concerned about you know, paying for uh, different food and beverage items. And there is that association that meat is more premium. So maybe focusing on elevating the perception of plant-based ingredients, proving out that value that they have. You know, I know the operator community sometimes has to pay more for mushrooms than beef, for example, in some cases. So helping consumers understand that, the value there. Uh, consumers also think maybe plant-based options won't satisfy their hunger as well as animal products do. So there's a concern that they may be hungry a couple hours later uh, that we'll need to solve for. And then primarily people are afraid that plant-based items and products might not taste as good as their uh, animal-based alternatives would. So as we think about those concerns, here really are the fixes for those. And this is really going to lead us to the mantra that's going to help us again, drive plant, plant-based and plant forward forward in our industry. So the fear that it might not taste good, we think this comes from years ago innovation. You know, say you were focused on making a, a healthy item. Maybe you made that like a veggie burger with a whole grain bun and, you know, no sauce or something like that. And that's not really a craveable item. Yes, it's a healthy item, but it doesn't solve for people wanting great flavor. So we need to take this flavor first approach with plant forward innovation and really focus on developing these plant-based alternatives with just as much flavor and craveability as these other products have. Uh, being hungry a couple hours later, you know, there is this misconception that animal protein is superior to plant-based protein. Uh, we need to, to correct that. We need to show that these dishes are satisfying and filling. We need to focus on uh, not what we're taking away in regard to maybe a meat or an animal-based product, but what we're adding back in and helping people understand these are dishes that will fill you up. And then paying too much, you know, again, spotlight what's there instead of what's not. It's not about the absence of meat. It's about the presence of all of these other amazing, craveable plant-based ingredients. So those fixes, again, they give us our roadmap. We need to follow this. This is our uh, strategy for moving this forward. And that is developing flavor first, satisfying dishes that spotlight what's there instead of what's not. And yes, there's a bit of a marketing or I'm sorry, a messaging challenge to this, helping people get that they're going to fill them up. They're good for the planet, that kind of thing. But it's really mostly an innovation challenge. We need to see and continue to work on innovations that are plant based that are going to satisfy consumer desires for these foods today. So with that, I'm so excited to turn things over to Chef Matt, who's going to share our first plant-based culinary demo. Hey, it's your friend Chef Matt Jordan here with Nestle Professional. I am the corporate executive chef on the national account team, and I am so excited that you are here because we have some delicious, craveable, plant-based entrees to share with you today. I am kicking it off with our Sweet Earth Mindful Chicken Avocado Toast, unlike you've ever had avocado toast before. Let's get cooking, my friends. We're gonna first start by marinating some red onion, giving that a nice thin slice up. Add that to our bowl. And then we're also gonna take some English cucumber, Cut that into fourths lengthwise, and then just get a nice oblique cut. And I like to cut it that way because it stacks real nice. Next, my friends, we have some beautiful, hot, sweet cherry peppers. Yes, please. We're just gonna take 
five or six of these with some of the juice, because I'm gonna use that in the little vinaigrette for the salad. And then just give this a quick, rough chop. Doesn't need to be fancy by any means. And that's it, right into the bowl. Now into our salad bowl, we have all of these delicious ingredients. I'm just gonna take some of that hot, sweet cherry pepper juice and add that right in, maybe about a teaspoon. Next up in the salad, marinated artichoke hearts. Yes, yum, they're herbaceous, they got oil and salt. Just add them in just like that. Start to give this a little scurry stir. Oh my goodness, and I could eat it just like this. How heavenly is that? We're gonna get a tiny pinch of salt, a little bit of freshly cracked black pepper, and then the star of our show, my friends, our Sweet Earth Mindful Chicken. That is the good stuff right there. Packed with protein, high in fiber, we love it. Now, the great thing about Sweet Earth Mindful Chicken is it is ready to eat right out of the package. Perfect for not only sauteed items, fried items, grilled, but also chicken salad, my friends. Add that right into the bowl. And what's gonna be so great is all of that marinade and all those other flavors from the other ingredients are gonna soak up in that chicken and it's just gonna be heavenly right when you taste it. Give this a stir so that it gets nicely coated and then pop it into the fridge for 30 minutes so that it can marinate. Next, my friends, the bread. Big honkin' slices. It needs it, trust me. We're gonna head over to the cast iron skillet. Okay, so in a big old cast iron skillet, I am going to add a lot of extra virgin olive oil, and I mean a lot. I want the bottom of the pan coated, and that's gonna fry this bread up and get a gorgeous, gorgeous golden crust. Set this to medium high heat, and once the oil's hot, pop that bread in. Beautiful, the oil is hot, add the bread in, you're gonna get a nice sizzle. These are big slices, so cook two at a time. Ooh, dog it. Look at that. All right, these big honkin' slices of sourdough bread don't take long to cook. And there's gonna be hot spots in your pan, so be sure to give them a couple of flippy flips around so they get nice and even and golden brown. Yes! Oh my gosh. Sign me up right now. Ooh, that's what we're looking for. Nice and toasted. So the bread needs a little second more on the other side. I'm gonna pop this one out because heat is ready to go. All right, my friend, you're up next. All right, that is what I'm talking about. Fried, golden brown, delicious sourdough bread. Take these slices, set them to the side, and now let's slice our avocados. Okay, next, our avocados. I'm just gonna take these, open them up. I like a ripe, but not overly soft avocado for avocado toast, and that's mostly because I like to slice it instead of mash it up. Just gives it a nicer presentation, I feel. Take the core out, take a spoon, get up in there, get the flesh out, flip that over. And I like to line them up because I just go right down the line and give them a slice, slice, slice. All right, got, we got these beautiful avocados all lined up. I'm gonna cut these into eighth of an inch slices all the way down the line. Nice and thin, that way it fans out on all the toast. Gorgeous. Oh my gosh, I love an avocado. So buttery and creamy and smooth. A Little bit of salt, because we're seasoning every single component. And then also some freshly cracked black pepper. Yes, please. The finish, you gotta have it. Just a little extra virgin olive oil right on top. Give them a glisten. Voila. Let's go ahead and plate up. Okay, so we're taking our mindful chicken, and cucumber, artichoke, heart, mixture, topping that right on top. Yum. And you just wanna like set it where it lays. Nice and built up. And this is completely an avocado toast. You're gonna eat with a fork and knife, my friends. Talk about the flavor, wow. Then, just for some green, we're gonna take some beautiful peppery arugula. Just let that lay right on top. And I'm telling you folks, one piece of this is a $10 avocado toast. 
Oh my gosh, that is a gourmet mindful chicken avocado toast if I do say so myself. You're gonna need a fork and knife for this one, my friends. Now, I know my friend Chef Priyanka has a delicious, craveable vegan recipe up next. Chef Priyanka, what are you making? Thank you, Chef Matt. Hey everyone, I'm Priyanka, AKA Chef Priyanka. I'm a self-taught vegan chef, Food Network champion, TV host, and an author. And today I'm gonna show you how to turn this lonely, boring old potato into these delicious Indian-inspired spicy aloo tikkis with a coconut peanut chutney. And this is completely vegan. Yes, you heard that right. First, we're gonna start off by making the aloo tikkis. For this, we're gonna want to grind down some cumin seeds in a mortar and pestle. Next, we want to boil, peel, and mash two russet potatoes. And to this, we wanna add some fresh coriander that's been coarsely chopped. Then we wanna add some minced green chili. This could be Indian green chili or serrano or even jalapeno, just something green and spicy. Next, we wanna add our cumin seeds and then a really big pinch of kosher salt. Remember, potato is very bland. And we also wanna add some ground unsalted peanuts. This is gonna give it a really nice texture and nutty flavor. You're going to want to form little patties. You can make these as thick or thin as you'd like, but in general, it should form around eight to 12 patties. While the aloo tikkis are resting, we want to make our coconut peanut chutney. So first we want to start with some freshly grated coconut. This is actually frozen, so you can buy this in the freezer section. It's really easily accessible. And to this, we're going to add a couple of other ingredients to help balance those flavors. Because remember, coconut is very sweet and fatty. We want to add some fresh coriander. And then we also want to add one inch piece of fresh ginger that's been peeled and also one green chili. You can use serrano, Indian green chili, or even jalapeno. And we also want to add some peanuts here as well. And the next ingredient we want to add is unsweetened plain coconut yogurt. This is gonna help achieve that smooth, creamy chutney texture. And then we want to squeeze in just a little bit of fresh lemon juice. And we also want to add a big pinch of kosher salt. And then we're going to blend that all together until it's nice and smooth. If you like a little bit of a thinner chutney or it's giving you a little bit of trouble blending, just add in some water. There's no harm in adding water into this. Once you've blended up your chutney, you can place it into a serving bowl and you can leave it outside if you're planning on eating the aloo tikkis right away. But if not, I advise putting it in the fridge right away because this is fresh coconut and fresh coconut does tend to spoil a little bit quickly. All right, it's time for the star of the show. We're gonna cook up our delicious aloo tikkis. In a nonstick skillet or pan, you wanna heat some neutral oil, like a canola oil or vegetable oil. Once that oil is hot, you're gonna to wanna to add in your aloo tikkis, one side down, flat, and it should slightly sizzle. If you feel like there's a lot of smoke coming off the pan, then just reduce the heat a little bit. But what we wanna do is basically cook them for about three to five minutes on each side until you achieve a nice, delicious, golden brown crust. And I use tongs to flip mine, I find it easiest. You can also use a spatula, as long as you keep them intact and they don't break apart. And then you wanna place your crispy, golden brown aloo tikkis on a serving platter, right next to your delicious coconut peanut chutney. Okay, well obviously I can't let you go without seeing me eat the finished product. So let's break into one. Yum. Let's get some of that chutney on there. I know, sounds like a weird combination, but trust me, it's good. Okay, I'm gonna use my hands because we don't care about table manners here. Look at that. How delicious does that look? Mmm. It is so good. Slightly crisp soft in the middle and you have the spiciness of the chili 
and the nuttiness of the peanuts and then that sort of sweetness from the coconut. It's such an awesome combination. This is so delicious. I hope this is making you jealous. Oh my gosh, yum. That recipe from Chef Priyanka looks incredible. Up next from my kitchen, my gochujang mindful chicken fried rice recipe. Let's get started. First start by cooking some fresh sushi rice. Next, let's chop some veggies. I'm gonna take a little bit of ginger, about a teaspoon, set the rest of the side. Peel that with my knife, slice this up, get a nice little mince on it. Fan that out, run my knife through it. Gorgeous. Oh, I love good fresh ginger that's nice and yellow, yum. Give this a nice little mince through, set that to the side. Next, green onions. So I'm gonna take the bunch, trim the tops, set those to the side. And I'm just gonna run my knife through again. Nice little small dice on these. And we're gonna include the white parts also, just to add that beautiful oniony flavor. Gorgeous. Next, my friends, we've got some beautiful Napa cabbage. Don't need a whole lot of this, just a quarter. I'm gonna cut that into four, set the rest of the side, and just take my knife and give it a chop through. Perfect. Up next, let's make the sauce. So for the sauce, I'm gonna first start with some gochujang, which is a fermented red chili paste. Add about a teaspoon of that to the bowl. And that is really smoky, slightly sweet, super salty. And I'm also gonna take some miso paste, about a teaspoon as well, really for that umami taste. Add some of that fermentation flavor, yes, please. We're gonna take some honey, lots of it. Let's say two and a half to three tablespoons. A Little bit of rice wine vinegar to balance this all out with some acid. And then a little bit of soy sauce, right in, a couple of tablespoons. And this should yield you about a quarter to a half of a cup of sauce. We're gonna give this a nice little whisk and we'll have this sauce ready when we start to cook off our rice. Beautiful, and this yields about a quarter to a half a cup of sauce. And it's so gorgeous because it gives you this like beautiful brick red color. We love that. That's gonna dye the rice a nice beautiful red color, add tons of flavor, some sweetness, salty bite. Yes, please sign me up. All right, to cook the rice, I have a cast iron skillet on a medium high heat. We're gonna add about five tablespoons of extra virgin olive oil to the bottom of the pan, yes. Time to add our sweeter, mindful chicken. Look at that sizzle, yum. We're gonna cook that until it gets a nice golden brown. Beautiful. Up next, we're gonna add our fresh veggies. Yes, please start to crisp those up in the pan. Wow, I love that flavor. I love when you add shredded Napa cabbage to a hot pan. It doesn't need a lot of time to cook. You just wanna bring out some of that chlorophyll flavor. Toast that ginger. Ooh, my kitchen smells so good right now. Now my pan's looking like it needs a little bit more oil because it's time to add our rice next. Yum. Add that to the pan, start to break it up. Gorgeous, would you look at that? Absolutely gorgeous, yum. You can eat it just like that, but we're gonna take it right to the next level. Look at that, mindful chicken fried rice in a matter of minutes. Let's see what my friend Chef Priyanka has next. Okay, we're gonna switch gears and we're gonna be making a crispy stuffed poblano that is not only vegan, but it's zero waste. And you're gonna have to watch to find out why. For our crispy stuffed poblanos, the first thing we wanna prepare is our filling. So that's gonna start off with some olive oil in a hot pan. To this, we're gonna wanna add some scallions, but only the whites of the scallions. So the ones with the most potent oniony flavor. And we're gonna wanna add two 
cloves of minced garlic, some chopped green chilies, about two tablespoons of unsalted raw sunflower seeds. This adds texture and protein. And then we wanna add just one tablespoon of chopped fresh coriander. And then we wanna add some mixed frozen vegetables that have been thawed. And then the star of the show are leftover white rice. This could be basmati rice or jasmine rice or even a short grain rice as long as it's leftover and cooked and at room temperature. We're gonna go in with our ground flaxseed. This is about two tablespoons. And lastly, we're gonna add some fresh lime zest and a squeeze of lime juice and the remaining fresh coriander leaves. Once all of that is cooked, the last thing we wanna add is about a tablespoon or two of water. This is gonna help activate the flax seeds so then they swell up a bit. Give it a taste, adjust for salt, and that's it. Set it aside to cool to room temperature. Next up, we're gonna make our delicious cilantro crema. We're gonna start with some vegan cream cheese. You can also use vegan sour cream. Either way, you want this cream cheese to be at room temperature. That way it's softer and it's easier to blend. We're gonna add a handful of fresh cilantro. Then we're gonna add one serrano chili. This is gonna make it nice and spicy. About half a teaspoon of cumin seeds, which is gonna add a nice smoky and earthy flavor. And then we also wanna add a pinch of kosher salt. And a splash of lime juice, and then a splash of plant milk. Then whiz it up in the blender until it's completely smooth and lump-free. It should be a beautiful lime green color. Now we're gonna make the batter for our crispy stuffed poblano. This batter is Indian inspired, so we're actually starting with the base of basin flour or chickpea flour. It's also called graham flour. To this, we're gonna add about a teaspoon of Mexican seasoning, a big pinch of kosher salt. We're gonna get that whisked up. And this is about half a cup of chickpea flour. And to that, we're gonna add about three fourths cup of water. I add it gradually because chickpea flour can get very lumpy. So you wanna make sure that you really use your arm strength to whisk out all of those lumps. Now we're gonna tackle that beautiful poblano pepper and get it nice and stuffed. So using a paring knife, gently make a slit down the middle without slitting all the way through. We just want to make a cavity opening. And once you've done that, gently separate it using your fingers and use your fingers to then remove the seeds and the veins inside as much as you can without tearing the whole poblano apart. Once you get that all cleaned up and ready to go, we're going to stuff up our beautiful poblano. So take the rice and grab a handful of that rice, making sure that it's at room temperature, of course, and just get on and stuff the cavity of your poblano. Now, you're probably wondering how we're gonna fry this up and if it's gonna just explode open. Well, to make sure that it's secure, we're gonna actually use some toothpicks and get that pierced. And then your poblano is ready to be battered and fried. We're gonna take our whole stuffed poblano and dip it into our chickpea flour batter. And you can either use a spoon or tongs to twirl it in the batter so that it's completely coated from top to bottom. You don't wanna see any blank spaces on that poblano. So in a large deep pan, we wanna get some neutral oil like a canola oil or vegetable oil. Once the oil is hot, using tongs, carefully take your battered stuffed poblano and gently place it into the hot oil, being very careful not to splash yourself or get too close to the oil. We're gonna wanna cook it on each side for about two to three minutes until the batter is golden brown and the coating is crispy and you can flip the poblano in the oil without having any trouble or drippage of batter. Once the poblano is fried up and crisp, make sure to remove it and drain it on a paper towel lined plate 
and cool it for about four to five minutes until it's just warm. Time for plating. So remember that leftover rice we had from the stuffing? Well, that is not going to waste because we're gonna be using that as the base for our serving dish. And once you have that on there, we're gonna take our crispy stuffed poblano and we're gonna gently place it over our delicious, spicy Mexican flavored rice. And on this, we're gonna drizzle our delicious homemade cilantro crema. We're going in with some sliced radish as well as some fresh cilantro leaves. And then we wanna add the green tops of our scallions. Remember those scallions that were in the rice? Yup, these are the green parts of them. And some wedges of lime. Okay friends, we've come to the end and I cannot wait to show you my final dish, the crispy stuffed poblano that is vegan and zero waste because we used the leftover rice in here, spiced it up, stuffed it into this pretty gigantic poblano, and then fried it up in a chickpea flour batter until it's nice and crisp, and then topped it with the cilantro crema. It is so good, it's hearty, it's healthy, meat-free, you'll never miss the meat. And I'm so happy that I was able to show you this dish today, and I really hope you enjoyed my dishes as well as Chef Matt's dishes, and it inspires you to eat more plant-based and think about more plant-based options for your menus. But before you go, I do have to dig into this and take a bite because I'm all about making you guys jealous. Mmm, -hmm. so good and spicy and flavorful. Oh my God, I absolutely love this. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so happy you got a chance to watch our recipes and I hope it inspires you. Awesome. Well, welcome, chefs. Thank you for those amazing demos. My mouth is watering. I. I know we need to talk about the recipes. It looks like our attendees are eager to get those recipes, but we'll dive right into Q&A with just our uh, few minutes left. So uh, let's see, Chef Matt, could you talk about yes. are your recipes? Uh, when you think about maybe a QSR, quick service restaurant operator or limited service restaurant operator that might be on the line with us today, do you see your recipes translating into an operation like that? Or would you say they're more inspirational? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Marie. And uh, the, I agree. I'm uh, I would I'm hungry now too after watching that. But I would say it's a little bit of both. So I really try to take the positioning of gold standard, um, more pie in the sky recipes. And you know, QSR uh, feasibility is going to be very different than family dining and fast casual. For the QSRs, those are really going to have to be really drilled in, easy operation really the one plus one sort of mentality. Uh, we've got Amelia saying, wait, wow, great job, chefs, love the recipes, looking forward to trying them. Yeah, we can't wait to get you those recipes. Uh, for the fast casual, you know, that's gonna be a little bit more cooking, the more speed scratch. Uh, and then same for family dining. With those recipes, uh, Marie, I would definitely say the mindful chicken fried rice, that's gonna be more fast casual, uh, maybe like uh, an Asian quick service restaurant, whereas the avocado toast is definitely going to be more of a sit down family dining or fast casual concept. Okay, awesome. Yes, thank you. Uh, and Chef Priyanka, I'd love to hear from you. Where do you see this trend going if we think like three to four years out? And do you think that plant based might eventually eclipse meat? Well, in my in my ideal world, for the latter part of your question, yes, I hope I hope plant based eclipses meat in that sense. I think, as as someone who is a vegan and as a vegan chef, my mission has never been to um, shame someone into eating vegan versus eating meat or 
getting people to actually rid their entire diet of eating meat. It's more about understanding the possibilities, right? So I come from a culture, I'm first generation Indian American, and I grew up actually primar primarily vegan. We didn't call it vegan, we just called it food because that's what we were used to eating. And so that first recipe that I shared for aloo tiki, it's, it's a very popular recipe amongst a lot of regions in India, and it just so happens to be vegan. And I bring that up because I think if we understand the versatility in plant-based food and vegan food, then it's actually much more accessible than not. So my hope is that actually whole foods in conjunction with meat substitutes and plant-based meats will hopefully eclipse the desire for, for consumers a need for meat. And I personally have a lot of friends um, in and around the New York, LA, like major metropolitan areas that are doing Meatless Monday, that are only eating meat, let's say a few times a week, because not only because of the pandemic, but because of their own health reasons. And also because many a times it, it actually can be cheaper if you go to the grocery store and only buy whole foods and minimal um, kind of ready-made products in that sense. So in three to five years time, I, I don't necessarily think that veganism is gonna take over, but I do think that it's going to be the standard to have a vegan or plant-based option at every fast casual restaurant, QSR, regular fine dining restaurant. Um, I mean, we just saw 11 Madison Park went completely plant-based, which yeah. a lot of people are shocked by, but I'm like, yay, now I can finally eat there because I've never actually eaten there before. So, so those are my thoughts on that. Yeah, thank you. I, I feel the same about 11 Madison Park. I, I'd like to eat there someday. Yeah, um, when, we go, when are we all going? Let's do it. <laughs> yeah. So, Chef Matt, what do you think, if someone is new to the plant-based alternative space, what do you think is a good kind of point of entry dish for a consumer? Is it a burger? Is it the yeah. uh, chicken dish? What would you suggest there? Well, I think my highest recommendation to operators, right? This, when it drills down from my perspective, what it drills down to is these operators with plant-based solutions, they need to make money from this. They need to attract a new clientele and they need to have repeat customers. And the way that you're gonna achieve that is with craveable dishes that are familiar. Pizza, using, for example, Mindful Chicken as a pizza topping on something that people know what it tastes like a burger, a salad, a bowl, fried rice. You know, it's really, what's also really important for operators to think about is a lot of the ingredient SKUs that are back of house are already plant-based. In addition to the uh, meat substitutions, um, you know, lettuce is plant-based. I'm sure Priyanka would agree too. You know, you know anything that grows from the ground that is plant-based. And I think that operators and the marketers that work within those operations have a real opportunity to not only bring in, uh, for example, like a mindful chicken, but also to spend some marketing dollars around highlighting pre-existing line, line items that are already plant-based. Hmm. Yeah, that's cool. I like your pizza idea too, with pizza being America's favorite food. Lots yeah, exactly. Who do, yeah, you can't go wrong with a pizza, my friend. I'm telling you. Yeah, I'll say. Cool. Well, Chef Priyanka, kind of on your mention of 11 Madison Park, one of the questions from our audience is, can food service be successful if they go entirely plant-based, you know, plant-based restaurant entirely? Or do you think it's better to kind of, you know, have that plant-based option? Uh, which which do you think? Yeah, so I, so I think like everyone, I'm very curious to see how 11 Madison Park does because I think the one thing that we have to understand is that cuisines obviously vary and there's a lot of cultural play into those cuisines. So like if you go to an Indian restaurant, it's mostly vegetarian and vegan. It's not, it's actually less on the meat side, right? But if you go to a French restaurant, it is heavier on the non-veg side. So seeing how 11 Madison Park will do I'm very curious to see that, but I certainly think there is there is a huge market for restaurants, whether they're fine dining or fast casual to offer completely plant based items as someone who pre pandemic, obviously, I hosted several pop ups um, throughout my culinary career, obviously all vegan 
the latest one actually that I did was a barbecue focused one. And my whole point in doing that was to show that you can take something that's traditionally meat heavy or meat focused and be completely plant based and satisfy everyone. And I had majority meat eaters at my pop ups because that is my that is my purpose, right? It's not to scream in an echo chamber to other vegans, but it's to showcase to people who primarily eat meat that, hey, you can be satiated and feel like you want to eat more of this without being like, well, I need to go eat a steak now. So I think if we're a bit more open minded and if we are if we're at the kind of level in, in the industry where we are able to set that standard, um, I think we're able to change the minds of people. And I think also breaking the mold of um i would say a very a western or american way of thinking about food which is having meat at the center and then a pro a carb on the side and a vegetable on the side that sort of three-pronged plate approach is is very american like you won't mm -hmm. see that anywhere else so yeah. once we break that perspective on the plate i think um there's there's much more versatility in what we could serve and the standards we can set across restaurants in the country I love that. And it's true that so many of the global cuisines are inherently plant forward too. things mm -hmm. like ramen, tacos, et cetera. Uh, Chef Matt, I know Nestle has a, a lot of resources for the food service community. If they want help with plant based innovation, could you share what you might recommend if our attendees are looking for additional information after today? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Marie. And, you know, we're really excited at Nestle Professional because we are sweet earth, right? We are plant based and we have ready to use, ready to eat, easy to use solutions uh, in our portfolio from our awesome grounds to awesome burger to mindful chicken and much more innovation in the pipeline that is really exciting because we are taking the market approach of we want to be a full solution provider uh to operators around the plant-based category and there's such a huge opportunity for operators right i always go back to the follow the money you know there's a huge opportunity for operators to bring new incremental sales to their business and you can do that with plant-based so i would highly recommend head on over to our website at nestle professional uh get in touch with your local sales representative and we'd be happy to get you a sample asap you know we're in national distribution so uh we nestle professional being the safest and the best in class provider we've got we've got everybody's back uh, out there that's watching Awesome. Thank you, Chef Matt. And Chef Priyanka, would you, uh, do you have any resources you'd suggest to our audience members who'd like to learn more after today? Yeah, one of them I chatted in there, but I've, I've had a blog for many years and the whole purpose of the blog was to speak mainly to my generation, which are millennials and now Gen Z about um, the versatility in plant and vegetable forward food. So actually a lot of you were asking for the recipes. I know we'll be sharing them, but the two that I shared actually are on my website. So you can find them there, which is chefpriyanka.com. And my cookbook is coming out and this not necessarily to be like, oh, buy my cookbook. But the whole purpose behind the cookbook is to help showcase kind of like not only the versatility in in vegan food, but to break that perspective on that sort of westernized plate of meat at the center and a vegetable and kind of carb as an afterthought. Um, so you should definitely check that out, which is called the modern Tiffin. Um, but but yeah, I mean, I like many other vegan chefs are all over the interwebs, all over social media with the purpose of getting the word out there and inspiring not only people like you, but people who cook at home and want to be more plant forward. So so you can you can hit me up on any of those platforms. <laughs> nice. Thank you so much. And it looks like, you know, we're two minutes left in our conversation. I'll maybe ask you both your 30 seconds of thoughts on any last plant-based inspiration you would like to leave our audience with today. So Chef Matt, let's start with you. Sure. Yeah. Thanks, Marie. And, you know, this has been so fun today. I will say this, you know, having worked in fine dining kitchen since I was uh, a wee 16 years old, you know, it takes real creativity and skill to be able to make vegetables delicious, right? Anybody can cook a steak and don't get me wrong. I love a good juicy ribeye hot off the grill but I really love like roasted carrots and eggplant. And you know, at the core of it, what's going to move the needle in the plant-based category is flavor. It's always gonna be flavor. 
and the sustainability and the social impact and the health halo that follows it is an added bonus. But I would just strongly encourage operators and everybody out there, flavor needs to be your true north if you really want to have a successful plant-based launch in your operation. Thank you, Chef Matt. Flavor first. And Chef Priyanka, what are your kind of parting thoughts with plant-based inspiration? Yeah, I mean, along the lines of flavors, like, guys, just please use spices. Like, I cannot reinforce this enough that spices are accessible across the board, like whole cumin seeds, whole coriander seeds, fennel seeds, like, I come from a culture where spices have like an Ayurvedic healing properties to them, right? Turmeric, like there's a turmeric rage now because everyone's like, you can beat cancer with turmeric and not get memory loss and stuff. But people like us have been eating it for hundreds of years. And I think that makes all the difference, right? Like you'll never see an Indian dish that's like, here's steamed broccoli. Like it's never going to happen. It's always going to have like probably five to 10 spices in it. So if I just, yeah, I can't emphasize enough. Just please use spices. They're so accessible. They're good for you. And they have a lot of long-term benefits that that really can outweigh any other sort of reactive medication that's over, offered over the counter. So um, that, that's my advice is just spice it up. <laughs> I love that. That's kind of like food as medicine too. Um, great. Well, thank you both. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to you, Chris, to close us out. Well, thanks, thanks, everybody. Marie, and thank you to Matthew and Priyanka as well. Uh, thanks for everyone who joined today. Just please keep an eye on your inboxes in the coming days for an email with a link to the recording. We'll also have the PDF slides for Marie's presentation and also some information about the recipes that were shared today. And we also invite you to continue the conversation on DMA's LinkedIn page. So once again, enjoy the rest of your day.